going to call the meeting to order. It's uh, 731. And um, I'd first like to acknowledge that we're on Treaty 6 territory, the traditional meeting grounds, gathering place, and traveling route of the Cree, Soto, Blackfoot, Métis, Dene, and Nakota Sioux. And um, I'm going to uh, I'm going to put up the agenda. So Alistair, as co-host, maybe you can continue admitting people while I'm doing that. We've done the welcome. We're going to have the minutes from Sucrit. I'll, uh, I'll advise people what the bank balances were at April 30th because we didn't get that out in the, uh, the, the mail out. Then we're going to have Jeff Robertson doing uh, news from space. Then we're going to have um, the, uh, our guest speaker uh, introduced by um, Dr. Morsink. And Sharon's got an announcement after that. Then we're going to have Abdur with Astro Imaging Corner and then we'll get to announcements. Um, are there any additions to the agenda? No? Okay, hearing none, then um, I will, we'll, we'll just carry on and uh, we'll go to Sucrit and the minutes. And let me unshare. And Sucrit. Okay, Sucrit, you can take it away. Sounds good. Um, just going to quickly share my screen here. Here are the minutes of the meeting. Um, they're relatively short. We had 72 people in attendance last month, um, approximately. And um, yeah, that's everything that you see on the screen here is is uh is what it is um so i would like to move the minutes of the meeting as as oh are there any errors or additions that anyone would like to let me know about speak now or forever hold your peace Typically, these minutes would be available on uh, in the members area, but uh, maybe Luca, you can explain what's going on with the members area. Uh, the members area authentication is broken because of the rollout of the new national system, so we can't get in there until it gets fixed. So mm -hmm. that's why we're looking at the minutes right now. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, what's your best guess as to when that's going to be uh, fixed? I would say September. <laughs> In time for our September meeting. Brilliant. <laughs> um, Maybe. One quick question. Um, I didn't actually know Denise's last name. Does anybody know it? And can they maybe spell it out for me if it's not easy to spell out? Uh, Boucher, B-O-U-C-H-E-R. I think Danny's on the call, is he not? I don't know. Okay. I didn't see him, but I don't, I'm not sure. Okay. That's the only um, update that I actually needed on my end, but. Okay, um, so Sucrit's, Sucrit's made a motion that the minutes uh, uh, be approved. Do we have a seconder? Sure, I'll second, but I noticed that talk by and the topic are blank. The uh, what, sorry? <laughs> yep, they weren't, uh, yes, they weren't scheduled at the time. We oh, I see. Do. Yeah. Oh, okay, so then oh. it's great. I second the motion. I could delete this too, just to make it not so confusing. There you go. Beautiful. Done. Okay, perfect. And then Luca, you said that you were going to uh, second, second your motion. motion. You were going to second. Perfect. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, I'll declare the motion carried. Thank, Thank you, you. and I will stop sharing my screen. Instead of searching for slide, okay. Now, where's our Mr. Robertson? 
I'm, I'm beside you, you on my screen. Oh, really? Oh, you're, you're one yeah. of the, one I of the sent the you a message to mind. ask uh, you to make me a co-host so I can share my screen. I don't yeah, know if you saw gonna, it. No, uh, but I'm going to do that right now. And I also sent you a message saying Miami Vice called and they want their shirt back. <laughs> uh, Don Johnson, eat your heart out. Yeah, well, I'm actually uh, not so much the two main guys, but the, those two other guys always wore shirts like what you had. Oh, yeah. I can't I'm remember a man their without names. convictions. Yeah, I need the hat, though. Yeah. 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 <laughs> All right. Jeff, so, you've got the, you have the calm. Oh, okay. All right. Okay, this is uh, the news for April. And uh, why can't I see anything? Let's see. Try it again. Okay, um, oh, here we go. Same format as before. Uh, very bad Walter Winchell imitation, the whole bit. Uh, and I was really disappointed SpaceX didn't blow anything up last month. spacecraft in Nana, carrying four astronauts, is launched towards the International Space Station atop a Falcon 9 rocket. This is the first time since the retirement of the Space Shuttle that the same spacecraft has carried crew into space on multiple occasions. Endeavour carried the very first astronauts to the ISS during the Crew Dragon Demo 2 flight in 2020. After achieving orbit, Endeavour separated from its booster and made its way to the space station. After performing a number of burns to match the space station's orbit, the Crew Dragon Endeavour docked the following day. The four-person crew will spend the next several months aboard the International Space Station. They are expected to return to Earth at the end of October. In the meantime, it's pretty crowded aboard the ISS. China launches the first component of their modular space station, Kanhe. Using their heavy lift Long March 5 rocket, the core stage of the new space station is lifted into an orbit with a 41 and a half degree inclination. Entering an orbit of approximately 350 kilometers above the Earth, the space station was released from its booster rocket. Like the Shenzhou spacecraft, which shares the basic design of Russia's Soyuz, the core stage of Tanyi is very similar to the core stage of Russia's Mir space station. The new station will require several launches to reach its final configuration, 
Chinese astronauts who previously worked aboard the older Tiangong station will soon occupy the new station. The Long March 5 booster stage will make an uncontrolled re-entry in early May and will land somewhere beneath its flight path. Space agencies around the world shared a common sentiment. The United States, Russia, the European Space Agency, and Japan, uh, whenever they launch rockets, they are designed to drive themselves down into the atmosphere where they can harmlessly break up after they've been used. Why the Chinese don't do that is anyone's guess. In the meantime, all the world can do is hope the booster fragments do not hit a populated area and recall a song by Tom Lair from the early 1960s. Once the rockets are up, who cares where they come down? That's not my department, says Werner von Braun. Carried to Mars aboard the rover Perseverance, the first helicopter to fly on another planet, Ingenuity made multiple flights in April. In the flight shown on April 30th, Ingenuity flew over 250 meters at an altitude of 5 meters. The mission of Ingenuity has been extended and it will make many more flights in the coming weeks. Cameras aboard Ingenuity show its path over the ground as it traverses from one point to another. Aboard Ingenuity is a small piece of fabric from the wing of the original Wright Flyer, the first heavier-than-air craft to fly in 1903. Ingenuity took this photo of the Perseverance rover while in flight. Perseverance was also busy using the toaster oven size Mars Oxygen in Situ Resources Utilization Experiment or MOXIE shown here. It produced oxygen from the Martian atmosphere. Perseverance also took these photos of its surroundings. Elsewhere on Mars, the InSight lander detected two relatively large Mars quakes, magnitude 3.1 and 3.3. Is there a whole lot of shaking going on? Six-year-old Scott Farkas asked what the little helicopter might be thinking while flying on Mars. NASA said they weren't sure, but maybe it was this. In news from Russia, two Russians and an American board Soyuz MS-18 for a trip to the International Space Station. Liftoff is as planned. Instead of the normal two-day trip to the station, the mission rendezvous and docks after only two orbits. The three new crew members are welcome to board. It's kind of crowded now. After a six month stay, the two Russian and one American crew of Soyuz MS-17 depart the ISS for a landing in the steppes of Kazakhstan. The International Space Station flew 258 statute miles over the Mongolian Chinese border. Moving away in our small Rubens, Rizhikov, and Kutsverchkov 
on their way home for a landing less than three and a half hours from now. This is Mission Control Houston, and there it is, Soyuz MS-17 under its main parachute. And as we described before, the white smoke is the nominal venting of hydrogen peroxide and oxygen into the atmosphere. Touchdown. Touchdown confirmed at 11.55 p.m. Central Time, 12.55 a.m. Eastern Time. After six months in space, the smell of fresh air must be welcome despite the heaviness of Earth's gravity. The crew seems very happy to be back home. April 12th marked the 60th anniversary of the flight of Yuri Gagarin in Vostok 1. The first man in space who died tragically in a plane crash in 1967, made a single orbit of the Earth. He would no doubt be surprised and astounded at the progress made since his groundbreaking flight. Russia is planning to land its first probe on the moon since 1976. Luna 25, shown here, will launch in October of this year. On October 26, Russia's space agency officials surprised everyone when they said they would withdraw from the International Space Station project in 2025 and build their own station. Russia joined the ISS project in 1994 and have supplied many of the key components of the station. In an agreement between then Russian President Boris Yeltsin and then US President Bill Clinton, NASA astronauts visited and worked aboard the Russian space station Mir prior to the construction of the ISS. In SpaceX news, Elon Musk was over the moon April 16th when NASA surprised everyone by awarding SpaceX a $2.9 billion contract to develop the SpaceX Starship for use as a Project Artemis lunar lander. Standing 50 meters tall, the Starship towered over its two competing designs. Drawings of the lunar lander version of Starship give it a 50 sci-fi look, something like the spaceship Luna from the 1950 film Destination Moon. However, on April 30th, NASA put the contract on hold after complaints from the other bidders, particularly the consortium of Lockheed Martin and Blue Origin. In the meantime, SpaceX continues testing of the Starship design. And that's the news of April. These guys must have no, no lots of time on their hands. Okay, <laughs> that's it. Hope everyone Hello. liked it. If you didn't, well, too bad. <laughs> well done, well done. Thank you. Uh, as someone who grew up watching Gemini and then Apollo and then the, all of the, and everything else, it's just, it's just remarkable where we've come. We're, we live in an age of wonders and miracles, miracles and wonders, like Paul Simon said, eh? Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to get us all back to, to Earth uh, very briefly by reading out the RASC Edmonton Center bank balances as of April 30th. So the general account as of April 30th had a bank balance of $34,758.23. And the casino had a bank balance of $54,371.99. So now you've been told. Okay, so we are going to move on now to um, the introduction of our guest speaker. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Sharon Morsink. Sharon? Hello, 
Okay, so I'm uh, very happy to be able to introduce Deborah Lockhorse to you. Um, I don't know if you've noticed, but uh, the people that we've been inviting to speak here uh, since we've gone online like this have been in Alberta and to the west of us, mainly because of time zone issues. And so it's pretty rare for us to get someone who's um, a researcher in, say, Ontario to speak. Um, but we're kind of lucky because Deborah Lockhorst is doing her PhD at the University of Toronto. However, for this last year, she's actually been living in Edmonton. And I actually met her for the first time a little over a year ago, just before COVID hurt and that uh, uh, hurt uh, hit and hurt. <laughs> and hurt. <laughs> Um, uh, so I actually have met Deborah in person the one time, and um, uh, and unfortunately I haven't actually seen her in person since then. But anyways, um, it's it's nice that she's in town, anyways. And so Deborah is doing her PhD research on an amazing telescope, which is made out of camera lenses. And so that is just so astounding to me that I guess we're just going to have to let her tell us all about it and how she uses it to study very faint galaxies. So Deborah, I think you can go ahead and try to share your screen. Amazing. Thank you so much for the introduction, Sharon. Okay, give me a minute to share my screen correctly. And I'll keep track of questions in the chat, but I'll probably just wait till the end of your talk before asking anything. Okay, amazing. Okay, does that look great? That looks great. Everybody? Okay, <laughs> perfect. Okay, so hi again, and thank you again to Sharon for inviting me to give a talk today. I am excited to be talking about my research, which has been mostly working with the Dragonfly Telephoto Array over the past few years on my PhD. Um, so I'm going to start off introducing the concept of the telescope and its design, and then I'll move on to some of the discoveries that I think are really cool, which we found with Dragonfly. And I'll also talk about my work with the telescope in particular, uh, which is embarking on a massive upgrade to the telescope. Um, so as Sharon mentioned, feel free to ask questions. I just wanted to say that before I just get got too far started. I'll try to keep an eye out for the chat, but also feel free to interrupt me during the talk if anything's not clear. Okay, so I thought I'd start with this image, which may look familiar to many of you. Um, this is the Hubble Ultra Deep Field image. And this is kind of one of the peak images taken in astronomy. Um, and the reason I'm showing it is it's not really related to Dragonfly, but to get into really why Dragonfly is built the way it is using telephoto lenses, I want to give an idea of why, how people have been building telescopes over the past few centuries, which probably many of you are familiar with, but I want to kind of phrase it in a way to introduce Dragonfly. Um, so here, I can even, so the Hubble Ultra Deep Field as some of you are probably familiar with, was taken by the Hubble Space Telescope a few years ago now. And it's an image of a tiny piece of the sky that they picked to be completely dark and empty of anything. And this video is showing us zooming in onto the tiny piece of the sky they picked. And after observing for 11 days, this is what they saw. So everything they saw in their image, thousands of objects, tens of thousands, is a galaxy. So this is kind of where telescopes have been headed is, as you probably know, is to image deeper to even fainter levels and to image these really far out small galaxies. So over the past couple centuries, we've started off, this is an image of a telescope from the 19th century, which was one of the biggest of its time, the Yerkes 40 inch refractor telescope. And Ever since then, we've been building bigger and bigger telescopes. This is the 100-inch Hooker telescope, which was used for some really groundbreaking galaxy results. And then today, the largest telescope uh, in the world, I believe, is the Keck Observatory Telescopes, which are 10 meters in diameter. Um, and the reason people are doing this, of course, is because the bigger your telescope, the bigger you have your light gathering bucket. So the more photons you can gather, 
The other reason is that the bigger your telescope, the higher your resolution is going to be. So as shown in this image, in order to, which shows the field of view of the Hubble Deep Field against the sky with the moon to scale. Um, basically, if we want to be able to separate all those tiny galaxies, we need to have a large diameter according to the principles of diffraction, which is on the equation here, which is the only equation in the talk. I wanted to make this talk pretty accessible, so don't worry. <laughs> Um, so, of course, if we want lower, uh, a lower s separation, so a higher resolution, we need to increase the diameter of our telescope. So that's another reason. So this is a figure back in, so I'm just going to demonstrate how this works based on the galaxies that we've been observing over the past few decades. So this is a figure from a galaxy textbook uh, published in 1988, and it shows uh, the positions of galaxies known at that time where they have plotted the size of the galaxy against the brightness of the galaxy. And you can see that all these points follow along a beautiful relation with some set bounds. Uh, but this doesn't actually make sense, of course, because galaxies shouldn't, should be able to be any size, probably, and any brightness. So these bounds, we quickly realized, are caused by observational effects due to biases in how we observe galaxies and how we built telescopes. So as we build bigger and bigger telescopes, we're able to probe to higher resolution. So that means we can probe galaxies of smaller sizes and we can probe to fainter galaxies. So we're going in the arrow direction. So as we increase the diameter of our telescopes, we can fill out the top left corner of this plot. And that's what we've been doing. I could show an updated version where we've basically filled out this top left region. In fact, I will later in the talk. Um, but what about this area of the plot? So this area has not been filled out. So by the time of Dragonfly's conception, which was around 2014, that area remained empty. And these, this is where you would see large and diffuse galaxies. So large galaxies that are either nearby, so they're very spread out, or just really large galaxies that are just very extended. So to kind of illustrate that concept, this is, I'm just showing four different images of a circle, a galaxy, of the same brightness but different sizes. So as the circle gets larger, it's going to be harder and harder to see against your background noise in your image. So I think this should all be followable for now, but let me know if there's any questions, of course. And what is the culprit of this uh, observational trend and our lack of being able to fill out that portion of the plot? Does anyone know offhand? Sorry, I'm throwing a question into here, but I will, I'll give 30 seconds. I'm looking at the chat. Sorry? Contrast. Contrast? Yeah, yeah, totally. So it's about like our noise background is too high, so we can't see the galaxy. And what about our current, and I want to continue on to talk about what about our current telescope design is causing us to lose so much contrast or to not be able to image this faint brightness, this faint low surface brightness. And that's actually light scattering in our telescope optics. And this is a problem that you cannot solve by building a bigger telescope or by integrating for longer. It's a fundamental problem with the basic design choices that we've been making as we've built telescopes over the past century. And it's a design choice that makes sense because it's what allows big telescopes to exist. But in order to get past it, it requires that we eliminate systematics. So um, to kind of demonstrate what I mean by light scattering, this is a very uh, extreme example of light scattering where it's a picture of the star Arcturus. And around it, you can see this huge halo, which is light being scattered against all the parts of the optics of the telescope before it reaches the image the imaging plane. And just as an example, if you were to put one of these larger, one of these circles 
inside that scattering disk, there's basically no way for you for anyone to differentiate between it and scattered light inside the telescope. So there's two main problems that uh, exist in our current telescope designs. One is mirrors. Uh, so mirrors are extremely um, abrasive, <clears throat> which is which you wouldn't expect, but on like nano scales, they have a lot of nano structures. And since that's about the wavelength of the light we're interested in, there's actually a lot of scattering. And the second is obstructions. So with all these huge telescopes, such as Keck, uh, many of them have your classic primary mirror, which reflects the light back up to a secondary mirror. And that secondary mirror will of course block the center of the primary and it requires some struts or supports to hold it above the primary mirror. So you have all these different structures in the way of your light causing more light scattering. So what is the answer to this problem? How can we remove those two problems? Well, should we go back to ye old refractor of 1897? And the answer is no, unfortunately, because there was the reason that we didn't use lenses anymore in building these larger telescopes, which is that fundamentally you cannot create a lens larger than about a meter in diameter because the material just warps. And then you have bigger problems in scattering. Uh, uh, so what, but of course, what we'd like to do is use some kind of refractor because this is a system that eliminates any need for mirrors and any need for support structures. Like as you can see in this image, it's one tube, light comes in one end, goes out the other. So except for solar telescopes in astronomy, um, in the field of like huge telescopes specifically, refractors have been dead in professional astronomy for over a century. But what uh, Professor Bob Abraham and Peter Van Dockham realized in uh, back in 2012 is that ref uh, refractors are alive and well in the real world as high performance telephoto lenses. So in the area of high performance photography and imaging, companies such as Canon, Nikon, et cetera, are continuously upgrading as you probably all know, so I'm probably telling you some information you already know, but they're continuously updating their telephoto lenses for professional photography in order to prevent scattering, such as you would see in this image, which is kind of typical of, I know with some amateur images I've taken, which I think is called lens flare. And what Canon has done is they've created these nano fabricated coatings, which they put on their lenses. And these effectively remove reflections from the surfaces of their lenses to an extremely high amount, to a very high order of magnitude. So the question here was whether we could use these telephoto lenses to create an astronomical telescope. So back in 2014, uh, Bob and Peter decided that they would just go ahead with this crazy idea. And that was the birth of the Dragonfly telephoto array which I'm showing here. So they started initially with just one lens and they built it up in stages to the full 48 Canon telephoto lenses. This is the exact name of the lenses that a dragonfly is composed of today. So as you can see in this image, it's composed of two mounts, each of which has 24 lenses on it. And as you can see in the photo, we have them set up at a amateur observatory called New Mexico Skies Observatories, which is in New Mexico. And right now we have three domes. So two of which contain these two mounts, each with 24 lenses. And then the third I'll talk about later, which actually contains my Pathfinder project, PhD project. So each lens in our array is pointed at the same spot in the sky. So by adding all of them together, we effectively have a one diameter fully refracting telescope. In addition, it is, pardon me, fully automated and robotically controlled. So whenever I'm, I'm actually observing right now, and I can do that from 
my couch. <laughs> Basically, it's just opening up your laptop. The scripts can be set up during the day to schedule our observations and then they are carried out automatically. I don't know if anyone uses this, but we use a software called Astro Planner. And I can talk about that maybe after if anyone's interested in how it works. And um, that is a basic intro to our telescope. So this is our team. This is actually the team as of about three years ago. So some people have moved on and some people have joined, so they're not pictured. But we're composed of people from the University of Toronto and Yale University. And as people have graduated from their PhDs and moved on, we now have people at Princeton and the Max Planck Institute for Astronomy and the Ohio State University. So there's a mix of professors. So Bob, Roberta Abraham, and Peter are professors, and then the rest of us are either PhD students or postdocs. So it's a pretty, pretty fun team to work with. So as of now, Dragonfly has been on the sky for about six years, and it's really been able to demonstrate its power in low, in low surface brightness imaging. So I wanted to show an example of that by comparing with some other data from other professional telescopes. One of which is the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, which maybe some of you have heard of. So it's a 2.5 meter telescope, also in New Mexico. And this is a picture from one of its fields. And then we observed the same field with Dragonfly, and this is what we saw. So it's extremely cleaner. And uh, a lot, I'll show them side by side you can see that a lot of the larger scale structures are much better resolved in Dragonfly. And one other strength of the telescope, which I forgot to mention, is it's a very fast optical system. Um, it's f over 2.8. And so it has extremely large field of view. So that's another strength that it has for wide field, sur wide field surveys over other professional telescopes, which, which typically have much smaller fields of view. Uh, okay. Any questions so far? Let me check the chat. Okay, so I just got a little cheeky question mm -hmm. um, asking if you're able to share your computer screen and show us what it looks like when you're observing dra through Dragonfly. <laughs> or is there uh, <laughs> I can show you my, um, can, you can probably see the chat. I can. Do you want me to show you after? Maybe afterwards. Sure. Yeah, I think that makes the most sense. But yeah. yes, I will. I'm interested in in the uh, aligning of all those telescopes. The lining, sorry, I missed that. Al the aligning. Is, the aligning. alignment of. Yes, so they're all purposefully left to be slightly misaligned because one of the one of the um, here I'm you know while we while we discuss I'm just gonna see if I nope I can't I, while we uh sorry. They're all purposefully slightly misaligned because one of the strengths of Dragonfly is that by having 48 identical components, we remove a lot of systematics. So things like hot pixels in your camera or like defects in your camera, defects in your lens, whatever, they will get averaged out. And that includes on sky type issues. So every, um, they're all aligned within, let's say 15, about 15 arc minutes. So, a large. Wow. So the field of view, oh yeah, I forgot to mention the field of view of Dragonfly is two degrees by three degrees approximately. So it's quite large. Wow. That's mm -hmm. amazing. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We have some amazing staff there who are able to adjust things for us because they can, so they can adjust things like the alignment, but in general, we're pretty flexible with it because we have so many cameras and so many different components. I, let's, it's funny, I think we throw out data if it's a degree away from our pointing, our like desired pointing. So we're very open to shifts and alignments. I see, okay, okay, understand. Um, sorry, I... There's a question, why do you show negatives? Oh, sorry. Uh, ah. It's very common, that's a great question. It's very common in astronomy for helping to see the contrast in the low surface brightness areas. 
because what we're really interested in is the background. So for, it's just a personal preference in a lot of ways, but we, I think it, it's generally easier to see your, your little variations such as in the like almost filamenty things here, if you're looking at black on white is what we found. Yeah, the misalignment is like dithering. <laughs> we also dither because we want, because of course we want the camera, each image taken by the same camera to be slightly offset. Yes, yeah, it looks crazy. So we're using CCD cameras from Diffraction Limited, which is a company, or they used to be called SBIG in Ottawa. And they're Aluma uh, cameras, that's their version. And this, the, um, the sensor is different for different ones, but the ones that I'm remembering is uh, Sony, they're Sony 894s, something like that. I can look it up exactly, but they, they're CCD sensors like 2048 by something else. I can look it up if you're interested after. Um, the weight of each is about eight pounds, 10 pounds, eight to 10 pounds. And sorry, was there any other questions or shall I continue? <laughs> The nice thing I was going to, I just want to mention the nice thing about dragonflies, we have extremely large pixels. So that's why almost our images look even nicer right away, potentially, is because we automatically are almost binning compared to other telescopes. Um, but that's okay for us because we're interested in large structures. All right, I'm going to keep going if I can. Great. So I'm going to move on to the science section. So before I talk about my own research and work with Dragonfly, I wanted to highlight some of the really cool work and discoveries that have been carried out by my colleagues mainly. So this is mostly on galaxies. And one of the coolest discoveries I think that Dragonfly has made is this type of galaxy called ultra diffuse galaxies. So basically, Remember that plot I showed at the beginning where there's this huge area in brightness versus radius where there's a huge gap? Well, basic, that's kind of what Dragonfly was made to do, was to look for objects that could fit within that area. So what they did, and this I'm saying they because this was slightly before I joined the team, was so what we did was just observe the coma cluster of galaxies, which is like the second closest cluster of galaxies to us. So it's been pretty, very well studied, extremely well studied. And we just observed that field for a long time to see what we could find, and whether we could find anything. And what we found was that there are a whole bunch of these blobs, blobby objects in the data, uh, which, they, which is marked by these, the locations of which are marked by these red uh, boxes on screen. And what they looked like when we zoom into them is shown in this uh, column here. We have four examples. They're basically very diffuse fuzzy blobs. Um, in order to confirm that we weren't just seeing something that wasn't actually there, some kind of artifact, we also looked at imaging data from a different telescope. We looked at the Canada uh, Canada France Hawaii telescope data because they had also observed the coma cluster of galaxies and they had archival data. So we looked to see if we could see the same structures and as you can see in this comparison so one to one here for each of the four blobs there was something there in their data. And I don't have an example of this uh, ready to show you but basically they do see this in their data but in addition they see many other blobs like this that we don't see in Dragonfly. So the kind of the strength of Dragonfly is that we can see these things and they're real versus you can see them in other data, but you're not really sure whether they're real or not. So I kind of digress, but to go back into the plot, this is the plot uh, that I originally showed where you have size versus brightness, but it's been flipped around. So I'll just flip it back around so that it's in the same format of the original plot I showed. And you can see that all these red dots 
are those blobs from our coma image. So there are all these galaxies that we found in coma and they fill out this area completely, pretty much. So everything else that you see in the right-hand plot are from previous surveys. So there's uh, lots of galaxies that have been found before, but nothing had been seen in this region until Dragonfly came on board to search within that phase space. Um, so the reason, the reason that these are cool is that no one really knows how they form. Um, so I'm just going to take a step back and talk about galaxies for a second, which I'm sure all of you have heard about. So I'll just quickly show different galaxies. These are galaxies, these are galaxies, 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 all galaxies, even though they look very different. And their basic definition is that they're gas, dust, stars, and dark matter bound together by gravity. And the one weird thing in there, like we know what gas is, we know what dust is, we know what stars are pretty much, um, but we don't really know what dark matter is. What is dark matter? So I think that's the main question. That is the main question that Dragonfly has found is really the philosophical question, almost philosophical, but scientific question that we want to answer, which is what is dark matter? So people, I, can, I didn't want to go too much into this because I didn't have that much time, but I can talk more about it later. But basically what we found is that in order to account for the mass inside galaxies, which you can measure by measuring the velocities of stars orbiting in galaxies, is that there's not enough mass in the visible light. So not enough mass, if you count up all the stars in a galaxy and add together all their mass, there's not enough there to account for how fast the, the stars are going in the outskirts of these galaxies. So if, they, if there wasn't, there, if there was only stars in the galaxies, the stars in the outskirts would just fly off and not be bound at all. They'd just leave the galaxy completely. So people have been puzzling over this for the past few decades, I think since the 1960s, can't quite remember the date. Um, and people think that dark, there were a lot of theories for what dark matter could be. So one main one was some kind of like dark regular thing, such as a planet, which isn't emitting light, or maybe a black hole or something like that, or a bunch of these in galaxies. Um, but by uh, doing certain measurements in particular called microlensing measurements, um, which I could talk about if you're interested, but basically people realize that these, there could be some of these objects, these like dark, massive but normal matter objects, but there's definitely not enough to account for all the mass that you need. So the general consensus is that dark matter is made up of some kind of weakly interacting massive particle called a WIMP that only interacts through the weak force. So you can't, no light interacts with it, you can't touch it. The only way it interacts with other things is through gravity. So that's where we're at and everyone, well not everyone, but many astronomers are trying to figure out what dark matter is. So where you can study it is in big things such as galaxies and galaxy clusters. I did want to mention there's one other theory that could replace dark matter which is called MOND, uh, which is an abbreviation of modified Newtonian dynamics, which is the theory that the laws of physics just change uh, when you're at certain scales really large scales, such as in galaxies. Um, but we, I won't really touch on that because the accepted theory so far is really dark matter. So of course, there's still people looking into both. Okay, so in the Milky Way, for I'm gonna give it just a case example. In the Milky Way, there's about 50 billion times the mass of the sun is in stars. So about 50 billion suns ish except some are more massive some are less and in comparison there's about 700 billion times the mass of the sun in dark matter that's about 90 percent dark matter and by measuring different gal yeah and by measuring different galaxies throughout the universe that we can see observable universe and where we can measure the velocities of the stars we found that this is a typical proportion of stars to dark matter so it is majorly dominated by dark matter. So one way 
how we're going to investigate the ultra diffuse galaxies is to try and figure out what kind of dark matter content they have, because that can really tell you a lot about what kind of galaxy they are. So what um, the team did was you picked one random ultra diffuse galaxy. It wasn't completely random, it was just the largest one in the sample, but other than that, random, uh, from that coma cluster galaxy, ultra diffuse galaxy sample. And there, they were able to estimate the total mass inside uh, this galaxy called Dragonfly 44. And they found there's about 10 times more mass in the galaxy than you can explain through just the mass in the stars. So there's lots of dark matter. So there's about this 90% dark matter to star content. Uh, what's weird about this is that that's about the same amount of dark matter as the Milky Way contains, but there are a hundred times less stars in this galaxy than there are in the Milky Way. So it's extremely faint. So the idea is that this galaxy somehow has a huge amount of dark matter, which should have been gravitationally able to draw lots of gas into it. But for some reason, it only formed a hundredth of the stars that it should have formed. So this is what we kind of call colloquially, a failed Milky Way galaxy. So we can ask, is this the same? Are all just all ultra diffuse galaxies like this? And to answer that, we've been looking at more of them. And this is another random ultra diffuse galaxy from a different group of galaxies. So this is um, around the NGC 1052 galaxy, picked it up. And what we found here was that the total mass that we measured inside the galaxy could be accounted for by all the mass in the stars. So there's no need for any dark matter inside this galaxy. So in fact, it could either have very little or no dark matter, which is about 400 times less than we would expect for a galaxy this size. So this is a very, this is actually a very controversial topic. There is actually a nature article published on this galaxy because it's quite strange. Um, and one thing that it really depends on is the distance to the galaxy. So one thing you need to do this comparison is you need to know how large the galaxy is on the sky. And then you need to know the velocity of the things orbiting, and then you can calculate how mass, how much mass is inside. So if this galaxy was not actually in the group of galaxies, but it was much closer to us, then it would be much smaller in actual size. So it could have more dark matter in it. So this has been a topic of ongoing papers where our team has shown again and again that it's at the distance of NGC 1052, but it is still quite controversial. So I just wanted to mention that because I think it's interesting to be part of a scientific topic where there's ongoing debate in whether something is real or not. So in comparing the two, one of these has 400 times too little dark matter, one has 100 times too much dark matter. So clearly these are formed in different ways or something happened during the evolution of these galaxies that caused them to be very different. And I want to mention that this is actually evidence for dark matter because one thing you can say is that MOND, Modified Newtonian Dynamics, is a law of physics. So you can't necessarily just turn it on in one case and off in the other, whereas dark matter would be particles. So in one case, you could add but a bunch of particles. In another case, you could take them all away. So it's a lot easier to explain, explain this discrepancy when you consider dark matter over something such as MOND. Yeah, so we're still uh, surveying more of these things. <coughs> And a lot of my colleagues are working on this, but I wanted to switch gears, but feel free to ask me questions after. I wanted to switch gears to talk about my, the focus of my research, which has been what about outside of galaxies and what is outside of galaxies? So giving a little background again, this is a similar image to the Hubble Deep Field that I showed at the beginning of the talk, but this is not a real image. 
This is a simulation of the universe, which was run by the Eagle Project team. So every bright spot in this image is stars and galaxies. So there's about thousands, tens of thousands of galaxies in this image. But as you know now, <laughs> stars only make up a small portion of the total matter in the universe. So I, what the simulation also can do is show you the view of the universe that we would see if we looked at the dark matter. And it would look like this. So it would have this huge filamentary structure, which is called the cosmic web. Um, and it links all the galaxies in the universe in this colossal structure of dark matter. Um, as we discussed, we can't correctly, we can't directly image dark matter, but we can image the gas which is very closely distributed along the filaments of dark matter in this image. Um, basically because stars, stars are gonna form at the nodes, but gas is less bound to the nodes of this web, so the crossroads of this web. So it can flow along as if the filaments were highways, funneling gas along them, and then into galaxies where that gas would then be used to form stars. So the question, that I'm addressing and have been addressing in my PhD is whether the Dragonfly telescope could directly image this gas in the cosmic web and make a map of the dark matter in the universe. So the idea behind this, which I think many of you will be familiar with since it's a pretty common idea, is that in order to image gas, we need to use special filters, narrow band filters. So as a quick review, on the left is a image of stars, whoops, um, which have over the which uh, emit over the full spectrum of light. On the right is an image of a nebula, which only emits at one wavelength of light, one color of light. And in order to just image that nebula, we need to use narrow band filters. Um, I could go into the reason gas does that, but I don't think we need to. It's just atomic physics. So as, whoops, I'm finding myself going into it. Um, anyways, so the, I, the question is whether we can use a narrow band filter to image the gas in the cosmic web. So in the first part of my PhD, I did a lot of work with the M Eagle simulation to simulate what the Dragonfly telescope would see if we looked at the gas outside galaxies and the cosmic web. So this is what I'm showing on the left. So basically this is a mock observation shown in the red of what dragonfly would see if we looked at a galaxy. Um, and you can see what we would see is this huge expanse of bright light outside the galaxy, which would be gas in the circumgalactic medium of the galaxy. So in the nodes of the cosmic web. In order to do that though, we would need to have ultra narrow band pass filters. So for those of you who are um, using filters in your own work, what we would need in order to reach the surface brightnesses necessary is less than one nanometer wide filters. So the reason we need them to be that narrow is because we need to remove as much as possible of the visible spectrum of light emitted from other stars etc around our around our targets um so typical this is hard and it's not very typical because i'm going to demonstrate there's a reason why people don't really use that narrow bandpass of a filter so typical filters have bandpasses more similar to this bandpass i've shown here so this is a plot showing the transmittance so how much light is let through as a function of wavelength. And it is a 10 nanometer band pass. So 10 nanometers wide. So the orangey red curve shows the design transmittance function. So what you want it to look like. But in actuality, what you're going to get is in your, your, in your filter, the light incident upon it is actually going to be converging because as you put your filter in the beam, uh, it's usually in the back of the telescope right before the camera. So your 
quickly focusing your light onto the imaging plane. So what you actually see is that blue dashed line. And it's not too bad for 10 nanometer filters. And this is kind of the tip, this is the typical narrow band filter, how, how narrow they go. So as you get narrower, so 3.1 nanometers, you can see that the um, observed transmittance profile gets much more degraded, but it's still okay-ish. And then if you go even further to what we need, it's down to, down to about 0.8 nanometers. You can see that the transmission function just gets completely degraded. So it's no longer any use to us because it's been completely spread out. And it's more around like 40% transmissive at best. So of course, this is because, as I mentioned, these filters are being put in the back of the optics. So this is just like one dragonfly unit, for example, in the back of the optics right before the camera, pretty much. And this is the conventional place to put filters. But if we could put filters in front of the optics, then they would be in a collimated beam a parallel light from objects at extremely far distances, celestial objects that are coming in a parallel. So then we would go back to those original design curves and we would see the desired transmittance of our filters. So you might ask, why has this not been done for current telescopes? And the answer is that in order to do that, you would need to make a huge filter that would be more than a meter in diameter because those are, that's the size of our professional filters, which just can, can't be done, unfortunately, uh, for the same reason that we can't really make lenses greater than 10 meters in diameter. But what we can do is put filters in front of all the telephoto lenses of Dragonfly because they're all very small uh, relative to you know, the one meter or plus diameter. So this is what my, project, my PhD project has focused on, is this concept. And I have created a mechanism for holding these filters in front of the optics for each of the telephoto lenses that Dragonfly is made up of. And I've called it the filter tilter. Yes, because in addition to holding the filters, it also tilts them. So for the same reason that the filter transmittance profile gets degraded, we can also turn that, that um, effect from a bug into a feature by, by um, just tilting the filters in front of the lens. And what happens is that as you tilt the filters, it smoothly shifts the band pass in wavelengths. So you can just scan through different wavelengths and image different objects or different emission lines, for example. So this is shown here. I've just shown the for as a like very clear demonstration, I hope, is that uh, at zero degree tilt, our wavelength is centered at about 616 nanometers. But if we tilt it about 10 degrees, it shifted down to 663 approximately, which is the wavelength of H alpha. So this is actually sidesteps another problem that people usually have with making your filters too narrow, which is that they're too specialized because you have that single emission line. So if you make it a wider filter, then you can get emission lines from different objects. But if you make it super narrow, you're limiting yourself to just one object. Whereas here, we can use the tilting to scan and look at different things. So over the past couple years, I've machined and set up these filter tilters, brought them down to New Mexico skies and deployed them on sky in the dome, in that third dome at New Mexico skies. And this is it being set up. So right now it's just a three lens prototype, um, but that's soon to change. Uh, with that three lens prototype though, over the last year, I've taken a bunch of observations of the M81 group of galaxies, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with it. So we've got both M81 M and M82 in our field of view. And I just wanted to kind of show what we're looking at. This is the continuum light. So taken with actually the Dragonfly 48 lens setup with an R-band filter. 
you can see the beautiful stellar light distribution in these galaxies. And then if we, I also observed, of course, with my pathfinder. Oh, and I did want to mention, I haven't yet published this stuff, so please, no screenshots at the moment. Um, still in press. Um, this is what you would see, what we do see with our narrowband filters. So this is with the ultra narrowband pest filter at a 12.5 degree tilt. And this is centered on H alpha emission. So I'll just go back to that. You can see they basically look completely different. Um, in M82, as you've probably seen before, we see these beautiful outflows, a cap of ionized gas, you actually see a double cap in M81, all of its H1 regions. Um, this is the same image, but just masked and smoothed. This is, and what else you can see in this image, which we think is really cool, is this huge umbrella shaped cloud here, which we think, which hasn't been seen before. We think this is a huge cloud of gas out almost in the circumgalactic medium of M82. But we're still trying to figure out what this is exactly. This is a very close group of galaxies, so it could be related to our own galaxy. So it's hard to tell. We're still we're taking data with other telescope spectra to try and determine whether it's part of our galaxy or part of this group of galaxies, but it's very hard to tell. The morphology of it looks like it's part of that galaxy since it's kind of in line with the outflow. But we'll see. I'm also taking more data at a slightly different pointing to see if it extends more. So I'll let you know <laughs> when I find out. And I want to show also that we can take data of the N2 emission line with the same filter at a 7.5 degree tilt or thereabouts. You can see it's slightly different than our H alpha emission. And then all together, this is what it's looking like at the moment. So we're seeing a lot and it's definitely encouraging, which is good because we are currently undertaking a massive upgrade to the Dragonfly Telephoto Array to create a 120 lens setup in addition to the 48, all of which are, will be equipped with these ultra narrow band pass filters in both H alpha and O3. And we're going to start undertaking an investigation of the circumgalactic medium of galaxies and the cosmic web. So currently we're in the midst of purchasing. So it's not quite under construction, but we'll be carrying out a lot of testing over the summer. And the goal is to have something on sky by next, the whole thing on sky by next summer. So stay tuned. And thank you. Thanks very much for your attention and for the questions. Thank you so much. Uh, let's thank Deborah for a great talk. Thank you. So we have some questions. Um, I was just going to say, uh, people who have questions, what you could do is you could unmute yourself and and ask. Like, so for instance, we've got a couple Davids who've who've asked questions, and <laughs> <laughs> if you just want to uh, <laughs> just go ahead and ask. I was wondering about the. Uh software you're using to integrate all the images is it done in real time and is it uh, off the shelf or I mean, you have to develop it that's a great question it we've developed it all so a huge part of my thesis was, de was developing the data reduction pipeline where we take all the raw images and then combine them into a final stack and before so when i came onto the team this had already been done by another grad student jai lu Zhang. And she, her pipeline would take about a week to run because there's so many images from 48 different lenses. So we've got it down, we parallelized it and it runs on virtual machines now. So we have it down to running in one day. And um, that's for our really deep fields where we have literally 10,000 science frames to go through. And what we do is we just observe all the time. So we have images taken during cloudy skies and bad weather and moon slightly up. So what part of our data reduction processing is to throw out all those frames. Actually, yeah, so actually our deepest field has 30,000 science frames and we threw out 20,000 of those. So the final stacks have 9,000 in them. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry, and it's all written in Python. 
and written by grad students. Now, sorry, I had one more thing to say. We, we are conduct, Dragonfly 48 is conducting an ultra wide survey. So a very fast wide area survey to cover a previous, to cover the footprint of a previous survey, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. And though that data reduction is quicker and it, it now happens uh, at New Mexico skies at the observatory in real time. So we reduce the night, the data from the night before the next day, but it's, it's just finished. Like it's taken a lot to get us there. So we're, we're just now able to look at the data right away from the night before. Thank you. We got a question from Doug uh, asking, have you managed to detect any ultra diffuse galaxies within our own local group? That's a great question. So, and I know, so, mm, no, so we, the part of the, I guess, limitation of Dragonfly is that it doesn't do well with resolved starlight. So things that are really close, like nearby dwarf galaxies, we don't detect very well because we don't have very good depth for point sources and you would resolve all the stars, for example. So if we're looking for something nearby like that, we're not, that's not really in our wheelhouse as much, I believe. Um, yeah, yep. Yeah. But it's definitely something, something that I think would be cool is we will be looking for that and looking for tidal streams for sure. Um, and David Filter, uh, David Filter, David Fielder <laughs> wanted to know how the tilt is controlled. Yeah, so I am, um, the way the tilt is controlled is in my very first version of the filter tilter, I use a star promoter plus an Arduino. So I just coded very, very prototype, just coded the Arduino to control the motor and it would, um, step it to approximately the right angle. And then on the, so it, I wonder if I can move back. Oh, here we go. Apologies, I'm just gonna find it. Here we go, beautiful. Okay, so the top here is the motor and the bottom is an angle sensor. So we just have a sh little feedback loop where we tilt the motor and then in the Arduino software, we, uh, measure what angle we've got to and then we just iterate until we get within about 0.25 degrees. Um, in our next version we'll be within 0.1 degrees which is what's necessary for this these narrow band filters in order to really get, um, t uh, select out the wavelengths that we need. Did that answer the question? Sorry. I, I think so. Thank you very much. No problem. Um, Joanne Cianos asked um, about the cosmic web and she wants to know, is this really the same, is this the same thing as dark matter? Or tell us more about it. Yeah, so the cosmic web is dark matter. So that's, that's the name for it. So how, how, it, how it works, how the simulations work is that they take the initial conditions from like just after the Big Bang, when the whole universe is this hot, hot plasma with just little density fluctuations in it. And then they let it run for billions of years. And you take out snapshots of time. And then you look at those snapshots to see what the universe looks like. And what these simulations found is that there's this huge web-like structure in dark matter. And that's, um, that was nicknamed by a prophet at the University of Toronto, actually, Dick Bond, the cosmic web. And uh, it's not been directly observed, but you can see it like in this picture, which is also a simulation, the galaxy <laughs> in real life, it does look similar to this where galaxies fall along these trails and paths and webs. And there was uh, the question of, what does your computer look like when you're assisting? Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Here we go. 
My guess is that you can't see any actual images, right? But Unfortunately, no. So I'm not sure it'll be as interesting, but I can show you what I would look like. So I'd screen share, and then this is the observatory um, computer that I would see. Cool. So I don't know if this looks like what you guys would observe with, but I basically just run the script from here. Unfortunately, I cannot show you what it looks like on Sky. Yeah. So what, what else we do is we BNC into the individual lenses. So now, because each lens has its own camera and its own computer. So you can go into each lens, each lens's computer and control the camera individually. And then you can take an exposure and look at the sky. But, oh, it's, it's late. I think. So what I would do is I'd first open the flip flat. So I don't know if you guys have heard of flip flats, but there are these illuminated panels that um, uh, you can take flats with. Has anyone used them before? <laughs> They're like this large and they just mount on the edge of your telescope. And then you can take flats with them. And we found they're very useful. So would recommend, I guess. Okay, cool. Yeah. Flip flats. Flip flats. So I don't know if this is gonna show you anything. Actually, this is so long. This is how you would take <laughs> an individual image with one lens. So of course, there's not going to be much to see. And hopefully, I properly opened the flip flat. But this is how observing usually goes, is there's a lot of waiting. So the first thing I will run as I, when I set up observing is, oh, that looks just dark. Well, failed experiment, but you get the idea. I, is I run a bunch of tests on the mount and then the focusers and then the cameras and just make sure everything's working. And then I usually open up a script and then run a observing script to get the observations going. So that, that is, uh, that's that. Sorry, it wasn't more interesting. <laughs> Still need to see what it looks like. Are there some more questions? Yes, um, Alistair here. Um, regarding the um, the tilting to shift the pass band, mm -hmm. um, like we, we know that, um, for example, the M81 group of galaxies is at a different redshift than the Coma Virgo, than and, and so on. So, mm -hmm. are you taking into a, is that why you also need to do it? That it's like, oh, that is redder, so we need to tilt it the the band pass. To the red yeah exactly so the exactly so the only thing is that when you tilt the filters they only ever go blueward so what we what we've done for our filter specs so what we've asked from our filter manufacturers is that they send to them at actually about the wavelength of h alpha for coma so that's like 665 nanometers something like that and then by a 20 degree tilt, we can tilt all the way back down to H alpha at redshift zero. Sorry. Yeah. So sorry, I'm mixed. I'm using redshift. I'm not sure how many people are familiar with that, but basically local universe. Cool. Uh, Thank 656. you. Yeah. Uh, because I'm an ex photographer, I know about the price of each of those lenses. <laughs> yes. Do you have a trigger daddy? <laughs> sorry. How do you, how do you afford <laughs> How do I what? How do you afford this? Oh. <laughs> yeah, that's tricky. Um, so what we did was Bob, the prof I'm working with, led a Canadian Foundation for Innovation grant proposal, and it was for $5 million. So just last fall, we found out that we, we uh, were awarded it. So then we started planning over the last few months to start buying and purchasing and everything. But yeah, it's very expensive. So that's why our prototype only has three. I think we had some like spare lenses left over from other 
from our Dragonfly 48 and that kind of thing. So we could we could certainly use a donation to the loaner program. Yes. Uh, you know, if you've got anything that you can pass on. <laughs> yeah, for sure. For sure. Deborah, it's David Fielder speaking. Uh, great talk. Uh, could you talk a little bit about um, the mount that holds uh, the Firefly uh, array? Yeah. And, and its tracking capability and maybe a little bit of information there. Yeah, so I don't, I can look up the exact specs for it, but these are custom mounts built by software BISC. I always have to say this. Paramount. Paramount, exactly. Yeah. So I think they might even be just modified off the shelf fork mounts. Okay. Um, but I think they have like tracking. They have very, I think it's like point. I want to say something like 0.1 arc second tracks tracking, but I don't know if that makes sense. I can look it up if if you want to know that detail. Yeah, I think one of the uh, one of your softwares showed that the the RA and deck were around 0.1 or 0.2, which is uh, yes, which is very nice. Yeah, so we also we have to guide because these exposures. I think I saw exposure question for the regular Dragonfly 48. We take 10 minute exposures. But for our narrow band observing, in order to be, um, in order to get past our camera noise and to just get like sky noise, we need to integrate for at least 30 minutes. So we also use guiding and we try to get that also within 0.1 arc seconds. So how's it going with PhD two? We all want to know. <laughs> 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 well, yeah, I know it. It's funny because I'm finishing up my PhD this year, this summer, um, but I'm already working on the upgrade, which will be used in my postdoc. So it's a busy time. Um, there's a question here about um, the filamentary structure and comparing it to Laniakea, our uh, local supercluster. Oh, yeah. Not sure. Is, is there a relationship? Yes. It's the same thing. That's exactly what it is. What we're seeing. So what we're just seeing in the local super cluster is just the galaxies. So if we could image between them, and if we could see dark matter, we would see these filaments connecting them all. Yeah. Oh, I, I saw this question. Does Canon follow your research and implementation? Yes, they do, actually. So they've we've actually, it was so funny. They've made a video about Dragonfly where they took Peter and Bob down to the telescope and drove around and uh, dubbed over their voices in Japanese and I guess shared it around. It's, it's a bit of a laugh. But it definitely helps to have some good like press for them, I think. And they definitely, we definitely want to encourage having good relations with them for sure. Um, are there any other questions? Um, this was a fabulous talk. Thank you so much for sharing your research with us. This yeah. was really, really exciting. And let's all thank Deborah again. Thank you so much. And if, if you have any questions, feel free to email me or ask Sharon, <laughs> and I'll get back to you. For okay, sure. great. And then, thank you, Deborah. And then maybe once you've actually you. finished building the full telescope, we'll get you back to talk again. <laughs> yes, for sure. Can show you lots of pictures, I'm sure, by that time. Okay, fantastic. Great. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. Really it was wonderful. Thanks. So, um, Sharon, I think you have an announcement you'd like to make. That's right. Um, I, I just have an announcement. I want to advertise a talk that's taking place tomorrow evening not to take any thunder away from Deborah here, um, but tomorrow, I'm gonna just quickly share my, oh, could you let me share my screen? But yeah. um, you, you might be aware that um, the RASC um, and CASCA, the Canadian Astronomical Society, which is the Society for Professional Astronomers, um, cooperate every year in hosting a, um, public talk called the Helen Sawyer Hogg Lecture um, to honor Helen Sawyer Hogg, who was um, 
a really important astronomer for Canada quite a long time ago. Um, and this year's Helen, Sog, um, uh, Helen Sawyer Hogg Prize lecture is Dr. Andrea Gez, and she's a professor at University of uh, California, LA. And in 2020, she was one of the people who was no uh, given the Nobel Prize in Physics for her observations of Sag A star, which is the name of the uh, supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy. And she's done really amazing observations of the center of our galaxy. And so she's giving a public talk tomorrow, and it's a cross Canada event, uh, which anyone can join the YouTube stream. And in Edmonton, that's going to be 5.30 p.m. Um, not this, and of course, 7.30 p.m. in Eastern in, in Toronto. Um, so if you um, have time on, on uh, t tomorrow evening at 5.30, you can tune in and it'll be possible to ask her questions. Um, and um, it will be recorded, so you could always watch it later on if uh, you can't make it at that time. So thanks so much, and I will stop sharing my screen. Thank you very much, Sharon. Uh, that looks really great. Uh, it's going to have to go some to meet the presentation that we received tonight, um, but uh, I'm sure it'll be it'll be well worthwhile. Um, so thank you again, Deborah. It was it was really really great. Uh, so I think we'll move on now to Astro Imaging Corner uh, with Abdur, and I'm trying to see where Abdur is. No, uh, Abdur uh, got a oh, I'm sorry, with Alice me. Yes. Sorry, Alistair, go ahead. No, okay. And share screen, share computer sound. And here we are. Okay. I believe I'm, I'm on then. Uh, welcome are. to Astro Imaging Corner. Uh, we encourage everyone to uh, contribute a picture they took, no matter the skill or the equipment. Sometimes a single snapshot of a twilight sky is more beautiful than a one-hour guided deep sky image. It's amazing what can be done with the simplest equipment, so please don't hold back. Um, let's see. I have to press page down, don't I? Uh-oh. Uh-oh. There we go. Um, so uh, to uh, contribute your images, just go to the main uh, Edmonton RASC webpage, and on the left column, there is a mishmash, a collage of uh, images, and there is a nice little link there for uh, the email for which to send your pictures. So um, please uh, do that. Send in your images. Um, okay, we'll start off uh, right away with uh, a lovely shot of uh, NGC 2403, one of our local group of galaxies that was imaged by Arnold. And this is a subject that has loads of detail and it's worth gathering um, a lot of lights for. Uh, many of these little blobs here are not stars, but actual uh, a distant equivalents of the Orion Nebula, so the uh, H2 region, star forming regions. Uh, so a lot can be done uh, with uh, that kind of thing. So um, go for it. Um, a little closer to home, or a lot, is uh, our own uh, star. And uh, it is currently uh, showing here uh, active regions 28. 18 and 2820. And uh, our sun is waking up from a long slumber of solar minimum and will soon be regularly showing us lots of fascinating features and loops. And uh, thankfully, we've got quite a few uh, um, excellent uh, solar imagers. Uh, so we'll be seeing uh, lots of flares and prominences and all sorts. So looking forward to that part of solar maximum. Uh, that will be uh, coming up in a little while. Um, Arnold also uh, showed um, or captured rather uh, Comet Atlas uh, recently uh, and it's been uh, a very nice um, but modest uh, comet, uh, very fun to follow this path 
past month uh, because it's orbiting in the opposite direction that the Earth orbits around the solar system. So the relative uh, motions make it a, appear to move quite quickly across the sky. And, um, uh, and so it's uh, scooted along uh, very quickly. Um, it passed uh, closest to us three weeks ago, and it was nearest the sun or perihelion two months ago. So as a result, um, it's uh, going away from the sun, so it's fading, and it's going away from us. Uh, so it will be fading extra quickly, and uh, by next month it'll be uh, a stinker, uh, faint, difficult object. So we've only got a few more uh, uh, nights left to catch it while it's still at a reasonable level of brightness. Um, one of our uh, newer uh, folk in the group, uh, Ethan, uh, he's uh, been doing mostly visual astronomy, but he's uh, dug up uh, his uh, old family uh, camera and he tried to apologize for using some really old gear, uh, but we didn't accept his apology. Uh, so um, we, we decided um, it, it's, it is the right thing to do, to use the equipment you have and to push it uh, as uh, much as you can to uh, see what it can do. And uh, so um, we're glad that uh, Ethan is very uh, proud of this, his uh, first achievement. So uh, well done and uh, looking forward to, to more. And so this was just sitting on a tripod and you get software to stack the individual images. Um, Warren Finley knows a thing or two when it comes to simplicity. This is a single six second exposure at f2.8 and 31 millimeters focal length on a Canon zoom lens and a 6D Canon camera just from east of Edmonton. It's a photo he's been planning to take for a few months now and he'd wondered if he'd ever get the shot before the uh, old shed fell down. It is leaning over rather precariously here. So uh, Warren notes that this photo required very little post-processing, so no exposure adjustment, no white balancing, no cropping, no vibrance or saturation adjustments to make it pop. It's just sometimes the in-camera pixels just work out right, especially a nice bright aurora that's uh, illuminating the field like that. Uh, really nice to see that kind of thing. Uh, Stephen Bergens was out at Blackfoot uh, Sunday a week ago. Some cloud was irritating us. We got uh, pretty unlucky with it. But as you can see, lots of holes there. So we were able to keep uh, some uh, part of our images. And we got a little bit of a weak uh, aurora in there to boot. Um, so here's one of his um, uh, shots, Markarian's Chain of Galaxies in uh, the, the Coma Virgo area. Uh, a lovely uh, uh, subject matter here. Uh, so Steve is uh, relatively new to all this, which is why uh, this image is not quite as refined as some of the ones uh, that you'll get to see by experienced imagers. Um, and um, so uh, uh, the, the good kind of news on here somewhere, there we go out of the blackness of space uh, comes the iris nebula beautiful little reflection nebula up in uh, cepheus uh, the dust obscuring the stars in the distance um, as you can see no dark frames and just very simple uh, stack and uh, change the curves a bit so um, steve was saying that um, it's one of his first deep sky objects and he's going to spend the summer learning how to process the data with photoshop and he said, um, I've got a lot to learn, which is cool. So welcome, Steve. And uh, that's a, a really great start. Um, with a little bit more, or a lot more, uh, processing experience, uh, Yusuf Hussein um, posted his first image to our local group. Um, but we can tell he's got some uh, fine skills here. Um, and uh, here's a close-up of that shot. Uh, so just wonderful level of detail uh, in uh, the famous Whirlpool galaxy here. And um, th this is the um, 
uh, another wonderful whirlpool, except it's called the, the Northern Pinwheel Galaxy, Messier 101. Um, uh, Arnold Rivera had a shot of it uh, last month. And uh, so this is the, the full frame width. Uh, you can see loads of little galaxies uh, in the background too. And uh, here's the uh, close-up of it. So that's uh, one of the things that pegged me to uh, use it as the, the front cover for tonight's Astro Imaging Corner. Uh, just loads and loads of detail right into the, the core. So uh, very uh, good hand in managing the, uh, the very high dynamic range between the faint outer uh, spiral arms and into the, the core of the galaxy. So um, uh, one of the things to note, it's a 840 millimeter focal length. So that lets you uh, get in there and uh, image that kind of detail, but some really nice uh, sharpness in there. Uh, zooming outwards, uh, wide field, um, uh, Sucrit has been uh, quietly taking pictures uh, during our <laughs> outings at uh, Blackfoot, uh, starting with just camera on a tripod. So she's been dipping her toes in the uh, otherwise very deep waters of imaging, but uh, thankfully we've got some shallow spots where uh, anybody can just throw a camera on a tripod and shoot away and get some really nice uh, images. So here's uh, the Big Dipper uh, standing uh, on its uh, tail, uh, pointer stars. And um, some of you may not be aware that the Big Dipper is not a constellation, but it's actually a, a smaller group or pattern of stars that is called an asterism. And uh, it is, Big Dipper is part of something more major called Ursa Major. And uh, so here's uh, the, the Dipper in uh, yellow and Ursa Major is this much, much larger constellation. The um, in officializing the constellations, uh, you end up getting a lot of um, uh, adjoining spaces between two major groups. And so uh, highlighted in green here is Leo Minor. And it, it, it is very minor. You, you only need to ever know uh, where stuff is in Leo Minor if you're actually chasing down uh, some deep sky objects or double stars, because there's really nothing remarkable whatsoever about that part of the sky, unless you go super deep. Um, other things that you can uh, do with a camera and tripod is take loads and loads of pictures and hand them off to uh, some nice uh, bits of software. You can use uh, Sequator, so the word equator with an S in front of it, and let it churn a while and it'll uh, pop out uh, things like star trails for you. So uh, nicely done there, Sucre. Okay. Actually, I just realized right now that the word ah is not ah, but ah. Um, so uh, last week I went to uh, capture a comet, and uh, when it came time to uh, process uh, the uh, individual images, I was noticing as I was just flipping through from uh, one to the other that it was like, oh, satellite trap, oh, satellite trap, oh, uh, another satellite trap. It's like, oh, geez. Um, so I decided um, on a lark to, instead of using the processing to get rid of the satellite trails is let's just show um, the maximum pixel brightness uh, of all the images in the stack and so that lets all the satellite trails come through so this is a two hours of uh, exposures and um, the uh, it, it looks kind of funny in a sad way uh, when you see it in movie it looks like a lightsaber duel um, sadly, very sadly, uh, this is going to be nothing compared to the full constellation of satellites from Starlink and the other competing companies uh, that are uh, going to be putting up uh, these flotillas of satellites. It's going to be just awful. Uh, and of course, in a way, it already is awful. And so the comet that I was shooting is actually this shorter green streak. Uh, so it's like, oh. 
that's a good thing that we can actually process the stuff out at uh, at our end. Um, so here's a, a close up of uh, that comment, and uh, I used uh, the uh, software called Cyril to stack on the comets motion instead of stacking on the stars. Uh, sadly, um, this is uh, kind of the end of uh, Comet Atlas's uh, apparition, and there really isn't anything interesting comet-wise until December, and then we're going to get, uh, like, fingers crossed, uh, a real beauty uh, that we should be able to see with the unaided eyes from the dark side. So uh, hang in there, um, and maybe if we're really lucky, we'll get another Neowise that'll just uh, come out of nowhere from behind the sun and uh, and surprise us. But uh, otherwise, it's going to be a long wait with uh, just a bunch of 10th, 11th, and 12th magnitude comets. Uh, so uh, a week uh, before that, a few of us were out at Blackfoot for the Lyrid meteor shower. And hopefully the sound comes through because there were a lot of frogs going on. And uh, so, oh, wait, there we go. A short post midnight into dawn. And of course, we cannot have a Astro Imaging Corner presentation without uh, the setting or rising full moon. This was a set just uh, a couple of minutes before uh, uh, sunrise and uh, just a nice uh, single image, uh, no fancy dancy uh, compositing that I uh, usually do with these sorts of things. So, a little while ago, almost uh, at, back in 1848, when photography was in its infancy, working on long exposures just for a family portrait and had to stare somewhere and not move. Um, that was during the height of visual observation and uh, Lord Ross in Ireland had a 72 inch mirror uh, made a cast of uh, tin and copper called speculum but 72 inches across made of metal that was a beast and it got nicknamed the Leviathan of Parsontown. And so he recorded, uh, made this sketch of uh, Messier 97 and nicknamed it the Owl Nebula. And uh, Tom decided to throw his uh, efforts at it and, and shoot it and uh, came up with uh, this lovely little uh, shot. So a sesquicentennial later, uh, Tom's at Pigeon Lake capturing a bunch of electrons and uh, the electrons uh, were triggered by the light of ionized hydrogen and ionized uh, oxygen, and he then combined them uh, with about two hours of total exposure into uh, this uh, image. And these are a lot trickier than they may seem, in part because most of these uh, planetary nebula um, span a small apparent diameter in the sky. So you have to sort of zoom in, and whenever you zoom in, you're, uh, you're pushing your um, equipment to its limits to uh, get uh, nice um, uh, round stars and, and sharp detail. So uh, very nicely done here, Tom. Then uh, ending on a, a lighter side of things, uh, a different rendering, a more modern of a sketch of this uh, might be uh, something like uh, that. Um, so is that a sketch, though, of the Owl Nebula, or is it a sketch of one of us in our winter stargazing gear? So uh, with that, um, 
I, uh, I bid you good evening. Uh, enjoy the spring uh, while it's here. Uh, and even if we're into a perpetual twilight, there's still a lot that can be seen visually uh, in overnight in the deep blue sky. And if you've got narrow band or medium narrow band uh, filters, um, it doesn't matter. Keep shooting from the backyard and uh, shoot right through summer. Uh, you'll be able to get some uh, really good images. And, and keep in mind, uh, summer is a really good time to uh, shake down your system, uh, go through the troubleshooting. I've uh, um, encountered a lot of people, whether it's at uh, the Northern Prairie Star Party or the Cypress Hills Saskatchewan Star Party, where here they are in magnificent dark skies and I hear, oh, stupid computer won't talk to this component and that component. It's like, oh, you need to get all that stuff done. Uh, before you get to a really nice sky. And if you do receive brand new equipment two days before the star party, uh, don't use it. <laughs> Just do what you've got. Use what you've got that you know really works. So um, uh, have a good evening, everyone. And uh, please uh, send in your images uh, uh, from the last few days to the next uh, couple of weeks for next month's session. Okay, thank you very much. Very good, Alistair. Great job, as usual. Um, and uh, we just uh, we want to move on now just to do some final announcements. Um, June 14th is our, is our next regular meeting before the summer break, and it's a, a member's presentations meeting. So we won't have a, a guest speaker. Members will be guest speakers, and I'm inviting any of you to um, put together something that we can present or that you can present uh, at the meeting on the 14th. Just let me know what, you're, what you've got in mind and how long you think it's going to take and we'll get it organized and it'll be, uh, it'll, be a, it'll be a very interesting night. I'm sure it'll be a good night. So again, that's June 14th and uh, uh, please let me know. Just to confirm, this uh, isn't a members only event, is it? It's just members presenting? It's a member's presentation event, but of course, everybody, anybody can come and take a look and, uh, and uh, enjoy the presentations. Absolutely, Sucret. Thank you. Um, other announcements? Alistair, do you have announcements today? Uh, yes, uh, we have uh, the, the National Society of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada is holding a general assembly. Uh, normally, in the past, these have been in person, but uh, they're still uh, lining up a whole bunch of uh, really uh, interesting uh, talks. So please go to rasc.ca and look for General Assembly, uh, sign up, and uh, get some uh, uh, interesting talks going on there. And um, also uh, coming up in very short order, in uh, nine days, so on the 19th, there's an Astro Cafe uh, for um, how to use your telescope, or rather, um, have you got a telescope that is giving you trouble and you can't quite figure out how to use it? Well, we've got the people to uh, break, go into breakout Zoom rooms and help you uh, get, uh, get that scope uh, up and running. Excellent. All right. Well, with that, uh, I'm going to call the meeting to an end. Um, it was great, and I hope to see everybody uh, on June 14th. And again, think about members' presentations. We look forward to receiving them. Thanks, everyone. Have, Good night, everyone. Have a great night, everybody. Good night, Good night everyone. See you Good night. later. Good night, everybody. Hey, everybody. Good night. Good night.